trick. Hello, welcome to today's episode of Juicing the Numbers, your statistics and sports podcast. I am your host, Joshua Tracy. And I am Corwin Heller. And uh, Greg is here again. Greg, you want to say hi? Hey, everyone. That's right. The Mayor Lander is still here. Discord's a magical thing where you can just see when you guys are here. And uh, I caught you. He's got it. That's exactly what, what we need when uh, we record. We need to be caught. Yeah. We definitely like, need yeah. to be stopped. That's for sure. <laughs> what would you be caught like, Corwin? If you were to make a a saying, caught like a what? Uh, I don't want to answer that question. Caught like a caught, caught like a caught like a skunk with a, a serial t- cheater. Yes, a serial what? cheater. <laughs> Call like a venereal disease at an origin. <laughs> infinitely better right there. Infinitely better. Uh so welcome, welcome to the show this week. We're uh, we're still talking about the um MLB Hall of Fame ballot uh, going into this voting season. Uh there's not too much going on in the world of sports as of right now. There's discussion about um NHL, which I think we talked about already, how they're moving towards a 56-game season, and basketball preseason has officially started up, but there's nothing to really talk about with it as of yet. Um, There is big and exciting news in the world of MLB that we're going to talk about to start off the show that we're going to kind of save more conversation for as time progresses and we get some more information on it. But the exciting bit of news is that the MLB is officially recognizing the Negro Leagues as a major league league, um, which basically means a couple of things. For one, it means that they are officially recognizing it not just as a ragtag group of teams that played baseball that had some recorded stats, which is kind of how it's been treated thusly. Um, It's the way the MLB treats to some extent, like minor leagues and non-affiliated ball play, where it's like if they have stats, they'll keep track of them, um, or someone in the baseball ether will keep track of them, but they're not recognized as being major leagues. Um, so they can't, they won't affect any totals going to your major league baseball stats. What this is doing is it is effectively saying all the production that you had in your Negro League careers is going to get put into your major league production as well. So it, um, I just actually combine my two points. Point one being that it recognizes it as not just some people who got together and played baseball and recognizes it as a high level of organized professional baseball, which it so absolutely fucking was. And it's going to be very interesting because it's going to create a, a, a com- combining of stats as we go forward um, to... Um, add to all those players who played in the major, in the MLB, add to their stats from their time served in the Negro Leagues, which is going to be a very interesting thing to see how totals change as we go forward and what that means for um, very retired Hall of Famers or non-Hall of Famers careers, um, how their stat lines look differently as, uh, as those seasons get added on to their career totals. So, Corbin, Josh, uh, Josh okay. do, you consider, do you consider yourself uh, very, very versed and intelligent about the Negro League? Because I know that you're super into it. Uh, so that that's a it's, it's a tough question because Negro League baseball history is very expansive. Um, it would be easy if it only had 30 teams the way MLB does. So. In some, to some extent, I would say I have a deeper than surface level knowledge, but I would be I, I would say I'm pretty far from having a a very deep or very intense knowledge. Well, the reason I ask is because uh, Governor Murphy today posted a picture of what looked like a very not tamed sports venue with some graffiti on the on the on like the concrete stands and whatnot. And I couldn't really get to the bottom of why he posted it until I went down into the comments. And I and you would and I'm hoping that you're gonna know. Um, because apparently the stadium was the 
uh, home of the Negro League team that was located in New Jersey. If there was only one, I don't know. Uh, the New York the, Eagles? Uh, is that what it was? And that would be my guess. And it was also apparently the host of the first NASCAR race I read online today, too. Oh. Now, granted, I'm not wrong. This is Facebook comments and something that just came to my head while you were talking about the Negro League. So I don't know. Do you know anything about that? Um, I know um, Facebook is a reputable source of information. I know. Very much so. <laughs> it, it's, my, it's your one-stop <laughs> shop for, for, for all your inquiries. Um, I don't know anything bad. I'm actually trying to find. I'm combing through. Uh, Governor Murphy's Twitter account right now to see if I can see this picture you're talking about. But um, New Jersey did have a Negro League team. Um, it was, or was it? The, yeah, it was the Newark Eagles. I always get them and the Newark Knights conflated. I believe the Negro League team was the Newark Eagles. Um, yeah. I'm gonna. You keep talking about stats. I'm gonna try to find this picture and send it to you on Facebook. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, please do. Sorry. I also, uh, it was the Negro League. Uh, or sorry, it was the Newark Eagles. Um, I'm not sure if they had any big time notable players. Oh, they did. Oh, Larry Doby. Yeah, L- Larry Doby, Monte Urban. Um, those are the two big ones. Leon Day, also a big one. Um. Uh, then they also had players like Ray Dandridge, um, Biz Mackey, Mule Suttles, and Willie Wells. Um, oh, and Don Newcomb? Way to go, Don. So, Wait, yeah, so, so many. Yeah, many, many, many noble players um, play for the New York Eagles. There we go. Um, and that's part, kind of what makes it a, a, a difficult league to know a lot, a lot about because they are so expansive. Um, and it's going to make the record keeping or the record compiling somewhat of a challenge, which is why I want to hold off on having too in-depth of a conversation of what this might mean for some individual players uh, as their stats get changed. Because record keeping for MLB was very fastidiously done, in part due to, one, greater financial resources, and two, um, just a larger body of people who viewed it as quote unquote legitimate and therefore cared enough to actually keep stats. Negroly teams were, as one could imagine, oftentimes just had less money and had, I don't want to say fewer fan bases because the Negroly teams did a phenomenal job packing stands, um, but not in the same way that Major League team, Major League Baseball, MLB teams, sorry, um, did. It was, it was, uh, one was viewed I, I hate saying the word like more seriously because it feels so derogatory and I don't mean it to be that way, but they, they were viewed very differently during their time. One more as an event versus one being a more hoity toity prestigious organization. Um, so there'll be some obvious changes like Satchel pages. Numbers will look super cool. They're already pretty cool considering the dude played, um, exclusively in like his forties and fifties. Um, in, in MLB, so he'll get some some uh, additions added to his Major League totals, Major League Baseball totals, with the the addition of his Negro League um, uh, totals that we have on record. Um, it'll be really cool to see what how that affects guys like Jackie Robinson and um, Hank Aaron served for a little bit of time in the Negro Leagues. Um, Willie Mays. Um, it'll be yeah, it'll, it'll be it's gonna be it's gonna be cool. I'm really excited about it. So is this going to put Satchel Page officially in the, you know, not officially because he still has been, but is this Satchel Page's chance to get included in the uh, best pitcher of all time debate? My goodness, that took a lot to get up. I, I definitely hope it gives more weight to that conversation because his numbers are going to look so much better. I mean, like... So Satchel Page stands right now. I'm looking at his at his stats page, um, and you know he he only has, let's see, I'm not counting his 1965 season because he played in one game and it was basically an exhibition. Um, even though he threw three innings <laughs> and got one strikeout, let up one hit, and had no runs or walks or anything, and I fucking love Satchel Page. 
Um, so he only has like five like proper seasons. Um, but but even even with that, they were ages forty one to forty six. He made two All Star games, a top twenty MVP finish, put up a three point two nine ERA. Um, I, I mean, and racked up two hundred eighty eight strikeouts in four hundred seventy six innings. Uh, like at from <laughs> he he put up seven strikeouts per nine in nineteen fifty one his age fifty one season sorry age forty four season age forty four season Satchel that Page was on the last Cleveland Indians team matter. to win the World Series <laughs> so I. The 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 myth is there behind Satchel Page. In addition, with with the, his major league service time um, being what it is, being a, a good indicator of how ridiculously stupid good he was earlier on in his career. Um, since he was able to do this, which is so good at the major league, at the MLB level, um, in his fucking forties. Uh, so I, I I hope that the addition of his Negro League stats into his MLB stats will, will make people realize just how fucking good this guy was. Which, to be fair, he is. I know. I uh, So cool, man. He One of the coolest baseball players of all time. Easy. Um, this, it, it, and, and, you know, I, I hate to, to, to bring the negative side of it in, because, you know, this is a really great moment that MLB is sharing um or is is allowing us to have to they they you know the Negro Leagues just celebrated their centennial this past season um and this is a great way to kind of end the 2020 year for the Negro Leagues which had um missed out on a lot of opportunities to get their recognition this year because of covid you know there was a lot more events scheduled during the baseball season then about to happen just due to COVID. Um, mm-hmm. But still, they, they still did a great Bob Kendrick. Shout out to Bob Kendrick, as always, at the Negro League Baseball Museum. Did, did Still did a great job doing outreach and, and doing a, a ton of stuff um, with uh, virtual events and um, community engagement and engagement within the MLB and, and clothing lines and everything. It was a great job with it. So to have this cap off the centennial is is awesome. But I, I, I still can't help thinking about my, my Bob O'Neill, my, sorry, my, my Buck O'Neill rant from, from just Monday, which is, once again, they're doing this like 14 years after Buck O'Neill died. And this, it's such a great moment that didn't need to take this long. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. like, it, it, just, it just didn't. People's entire lives' work have gone into this moment that we'll never get to see this. And again, it is if if this never happened, the Negro Leagues would be a beautiful thing that will always deserve to be celebrated on its own, absolutely no matter what. But the fact of the matter is people have been fighting for this for years. Years. I like literally at least 30 years is how old the Negro League Baseball Museum is. Which started in like like a literal like office space. And it just fucking sucks. That it's still behind the eight ball on everything. Oh, gotta love. Uh, I don't know. I I don't even want to make a joke here because it, it's not deserving of one. You know, like it's deserving of the serious conversations that we we do ha- tend to have now and again. Um, and it's just you know a shame. Yeah, well, the joke here is Major League Baseball, but. Well, I'll give them a slight pass for, for the next few days, so people can thoroughly and truly enjoy the uh, celebratory event that is uh, the Negro League getting. And I hate the fact that like Major League Baseball gets to decide who we officially recognize as being uh, as being Major League Baseball. It's like the Negro Leagues were Major League Baseball. Negro Leaguers right. won MVP like what, like eight out of the ten seasons after integration. Because that's how good Negro League Baseball was. That they that after MLB integrated, it was it, it was black people's game to fucking run, and they fucking ran it. 
Well, I mean, it just kind of goes back to just the the systematic racism involved with baseball for so fucking long that there is still to this day when everyone on the well, I was going to say everyone on the planet can agree, but we all know that's not entirely accurate. But we, you know, in the public eye are all in agreement that integration was one of the best things for baseball that, you know, black players are an integral part of of who baseball is, whether it be, you know, Hispanic or, you know, African players where it's still having this umbrella, this fog just hanging over both the reputation and the inner workings of MLB, it's fucking disgusting. The fact that it took us until 2020 to say, okay, this entire league of players that for decades was the pinnacle of minority baseball players and baseball talent as a whole as being okay, something that we can recognize as being not necessarily even having to be on par with MLB baseball, just something that can be considered a peer. And it's just ridiculous that it's taken this long and and even now having this conversation, it's just disgusting. Yeah, and it's... it's, it's All of us here agree on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and it's brought up... uh... Another old conversation, which is the fact that um, baseball, MLB, did not view the Negro Leagues as being a legitimate baseball organization in the 40s and 50s when they started signing Negro League players, which means they broke all the contracts and agreements that the Negro Leagues had with their players and just took those players away. And You know, you don't fault the players for leaving because this was the chance to see a higher payday um, and to to play at, you know, the quote-unquote major league level. You know, it's no one ever, you know, feels, uh, judges a a college athlete for for jumping ship from a a university in their sophomore, after their sophomore, junior year to go into the NFL, you know, but that college program might be worse off without them. You know, uh, fucking whatever school Trevor Lawrence plays for, Clemson, probably could use him next year and uh they ain't gonna have him but this actually had much bigger stakes because if you uh you know if you were bringing people into 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 your stadium under the guise of seeing jackie robinson and uh satchel page and then all of a sudden those guys aren't there not only is the quality of your product worse you also don't have that marquee value and it and you got no compensation for losing those players. And it really led to the even faster death of the Negro Leagues than um, and it would have happened naturally just due to, you know, the best players eventually going into the major leagues anyway, whether through college and, and minor league systems or being sold, uh, having their contracts sold to major league teams. But it, it really just fucked over Negro League baseball ownership. Um, a lot of teams being owned by black people or at least being run by black people um which is part of the reason they were viewed so illegitimately um i saw someone talking about how that whole part of baseball history is one of the things that really led to the absolute dearth of black uh front offices that we see in mlb today which i thought was a fascinating point um but there's a lot to get into with that i'm not sure we have uh I'm not sure I'm well versed enough in it to, to really give it what it's due. But uh. Yeah, man. I do love how much you love something that, you know, we were never alive to really see. You know, like none of us here have ever watched, you know, well maybe reruns, but have ever watched a Negro League baseball game. It's really something that I knew existed, but never never really knew any details about. It was really just, okay, the Negro Leagues were a thing. That's where Jackie Robinson played. And 
that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge before really, you know, digging into this with you like we have. And Josh, I'm assuming you I just love how in depth you've grown your knowledge of it and grown, you know, the knowledge of those around you by how much you love talking about it. I I I I find it to be such a unique and powerful part of um of the nation's history in addition to sports history, which really just puts two of my favorite things together. Um and uh I appreciate you always being willing to, to listen to me talk about it because I, I am enamored with this subject. Um what were you saying there, Greg? I, I apologize. I was I was trying to find my way in there, but I yeah, I did not I did not succeed. Um, but my question, you know, one thing Corwin said was watching older reruns. I have not done that before with the Negro League. And, you know, now that I, I haven't even thought about that being an option, you know, I've gone back and watched old golf tournaments. You know, they have, uh, they have like, you know, they do like the Masters recap or like the PGA Championships recap every year and they turn it into like an hour long movie to kind of show what happened over the course of the weekend and you can watch the ones from like the 60s that are like really old school and really different and whatnot and I, you know going back to the topic at hand i can only imagine going back to watch one of these is a totally different you know not only just of course the quality and the way they did it was probably much different but the atmosphere i would love to i mean what, what do you guys take on that like i can only imagine the atmosphere is such a different animal than you know what we see in today's like you know, what we see in today's, I mean, COVID aside, you know, what we see in today's society when it comes to going to a baseball game. Oh, yeah. Like, were they more rowdy, right? Like, were they were they more, you know, more rowdy? Like, I, I literally think of, like, Chinese baseball, where they have fucking air horns and shit. Damn. Like, were they like that? Like, what was it like? So, it, it, it depends. Um, so, for one thing, one of the first things that is majorly different about having gone to a Negro League game versus a Major League Baseball game is that um, because you have to play baseball at stadiums. You know, you need seats to fill, to sell tickets to. And yeah. Negro League teams couldn't often get times during the day because those would be used for, if not professional baseball teams, or, or again, Major League Baseball teams, um, MLB teams, which would play in their actual stadiums, it even be held, you know, to for like men's leagues games or whatever. So what a lot of ne- the Negro leagues were the first league um, to play night games, and they would bring around and tote around their own uh, floodlights and stadium lights to play baseball at night. And mm-hmm. that's first. So first off, that was a huge difference between going to the two, and of its own right. The only time no, that they really they weren't mm-hmm. playing at like Wrigley Field, were they? No, actually, ironically oh. enough, Wrigley Field was the last baseball stadium to install lights to play night games. I don't think that's Wrigley played a night game until like the 1970s. Yeah, that's why I asked. I I, I think I knew that. Yeah, Holy yeah, they were like way late on it. Um, and and the Negroes have been doing it since like the 20s or 30s. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, no, they were super early to the game. Um, How the hell were they affording all the floodlights and stuff, though? Like, I can't imagine that the players were getting paid too much. I can't imagine that there was a lot of money for the system. Uh, there, there oftentimes wasn't. Uh, you'd get owner, some owners who had some money. Um, the woman who owned... Um, oh, God, what, were, what team am I trying to think of? I want to say it was the New York Cubans, maybe? The New York Black Sox. There was there was a female owner of a Negro League team, which was a huge deal. And I know she had some money, and she loved her Negro League team and put a lot of money into it. So you 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 you'd get some owners who actually were able to fork up cash. Plus, ingenuity, man. You you find a way to do it if you if you if there's a will, there's a way to a lot of this shit, which is yeah, part of just what totally. makes it so miraculous. Um, totally. But so there's that. One of the one time that the that the Negro League teams were usually truly allotted um, the ability to get nighttime or uh, primetime day games with Sundays. And so what would end up happening is you would have um, a lot of 
uh, attendees of the Negro League games on Sundays actually come straight from church. So um, you would get very, very well-dressed, like suit and tie, formal Sunday best people going to Negro League games um, because they were coming like straight from God's house to go see the Monarchs. Um, I think also baseball in general, baseball games in general were more rowdy back then. I'm not going to say that's a Negro League versus a Major League Baseball thing um, because, you know, we've we've seen videos of, of crowds going all the way up to the seventies, like storming the fields. I mean, if you look at the video of, um, Hank Aaron hitting his 715th home run to pass Babe Ruth. I mean, he, there's fans touching him at second base, like running the bases with him. Um, and I, I think that happened in Atlanta, um, regardless. So, uh, I think your average, I think your average sports crowd was just bigger and, and louder back then anyway. So, I'm not. I'm not aware of any large discrepancy between, uh, or large difference between um, MLB and the Negro Leagues at that time. But I know that uh, there were some very notable differences. Also, usually just smaller crowds in general, but um, only mainly because they went to smaller stadiums, which they usually ended up doing a very good job of, if not completely selling out, at least um, selling large amounts of tickets. They were very good about that. Right. Right. Interesting. I I definitely want to go back and you know jump on YouTube and try to find some of these old uh, some of these older videos of what they actually had on film. I well, I can't imagine the camera's got to be like behind home plate and that's about it. Uh you'll probably end up just finding like pieces of film here and there. there this is not great documentation of it. Um, at least not not that I've seen. I've seen little clips. You know, I've seen. Um, some some satchel page reel i've seen some bob gibson reel but i haven't seen any like complete games or anything so it'll be it'll be sparse but i'm sure you'll find some cool stuff interesting that's on the list i'll have to do something yeah and again shout, shout out to plug in, plug in bob kendrick here if you, if you look up bob kendrick and uh and buck o'neill they have a ton of stories about these guys um that'll that'll really just capture you i mean it, it's such an interesting listen what was the names again? Bob Kendrick and Buck O'Neill. Buck Kendrick. Oh, oh, here we go. Bob Kendrick on Buck O'Neill. There you go. There you go. There you go. These are on the list. I have. I'm. I'm saving them. I'm gonna watch that later. Thank you, Josh. Of course, buddy. Of course. Um. So I don't think I don't know if I have anything else creative left to say. Uh, either of you guys any, got any more questions on on, uh, on Negro League stuff before we pivot over to the um, uh, Hall of Fame conversation again? I'm probably going to jump off after we wrap up Negro League, unless there's something else that you can think of that you can talk about with me. Uh, I'm not. I'm not so sure. I, don't know, I think that's kind of it. I want to. I definitely want to make sure we talk. Corey and I talk about Mark Gurley today, because um, I really wanted to on uh, Monday's episode. We didn't get. The, we didn't have time, so we'll probably pivot on over to that. Uh, Corwin, do you have anything else? I wonder if he's still alive. Do you have any questions for me, Corwin? Do you want to know about my life? Oh, Josh, you might be stuck with me for the rest God of the damn it. I've been on mute this whole fucking time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We oh, know my really. God. <laughs> I've been sitting here, like, asking questions, just, like, getting more and more, like, annoyed. Like, yes, I am asking this question. I am still asking the same question. <laughs> can, I tell, can I tell a quick side story that's kind of really cool and funny? Please. Go ahead. For work the other day, I was on a client call. And I was going through a bunch of stuff on a status sheet and just saying where certain projects are and whatnot. And, you know, we're going over like some market research or something. And they had some questions. And I was, you know, proposing a question. And so in the middle of it, I, I've got my headphones connected or I've got my speaker connected to my laptop and my phone's connected to it too. So I'm talking to them, seeing if, you know, they, you know, you know, have any other questions. And I, you know, usually have a little spiel to like wrap up the call and talk about next steps and whatnot. Um, but in the middle of it, my brother called me. I didn't even notice. So I just kind of ignored it. And, and Or no, he didn't call me. I take this totally back. He didn't call me whatsoever. And 
all the same. Exactly. That Greg's lying to us. No, I, I, I started to lie a little bit, but I'm, I'm backtracking now. But all of a sudden, I'm looking at my computer, and I see these messages coming through. And it's, it's the client who's messaging, like, within our little meeting room, like, can you hear us, Greg? Like, can you talk? Um, they can hear everything I'm saying. My speaker just turned off in the middle of it. And so I'm just talking like nobody's talking back at me. And apparently all of them were like, can he not hear us? Like, is, does he not notice that we're like asking questions? Apparently I cut somebody off in the middle of one of their questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh no, Greg. Classic Greg moment. Classic Greg. Classic. So, but sorry, Corwin, you had questions. Yeah, who's your favorite Negro League team? Me, personally? Well, both of you, personally. No. I, uh, I can't answer that. I don't know enough. I mean, it it's tough to say because, for one, there was a bunch. And um, for another thing, like there, I'm probably going to give basic bit answers because that's what I'm here to do. Because um, we're so, all basic bitches here. I mean, if we're being honest, <laughs> uh, so, you know, like like the Monarchs are are such a cool team because it seems like everybody, everybody whose name you know, like almost definitely went through the Monarchs at one point or another. Um, similar thing with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. I think they're um, Pittsburgh Crawfords homestead Grays. Yeah, uh, well, and the homestead Grays are also, I believe, a Pittsburgh based team. Um, so again, and this again goes back to something core I talk about all the time which is that Pittsburgh is very much so a baseball town. Present-day ownership just doesn't treat it like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, but there was a there's, there's a... there's a bunch of great teams. Chicago had the, the Chicago American Giants. New York had the New York Cuban Giants, the New York Black uh, Black Yankees. Um, oh, there's a, there's a bunch of fucking teams that all over the goddamn place. The uh, Alabama Black Crackers... Um, the what? The Birmingham, Birmingham Black Crackers. Yeah. The that's Birmingham what. Black Crack. Is yeah. that a race thing? That's got to be a play, that's got to be a play on, you know, calling white people crackers back in that time, right? It has to be. Like that is that like the m- most derogatory word that we can still say? A black, black cracker? cracker like you're so white on the inside. You're a cracker, but you're black. A- Black crack. I I have no idea. Um, I'm saying the word a lot, and I feel like I shouldn't be. Yeah, I think we need to stop before someone thinks we're bad people. Well, uh, they already know we're bad people. It's just you know, better people than this. Speak for yourself, Corwin. <laughs> Fair this enough. is true. <laughs> this this is true. <laughs> um, Indianapolis Clowns are also a cool team because um. <laughs> For one thing, you know what? <laughs> are, these, are, these, are you sure these are Negro League teams, or are you just listing a bunch of minor league single A? This, this is the thing. I could be lying about every team name I said, and you guys would have no idea. Um, the Monarchs are the only team I recognize. No, so so the the Indianapolis Clowns are a cool team because um, that is where Hank Aaron played. Um, oh, it, he spent his one Negro League season with the. Um, Indianapolis Clowns, and they also had. Um, I don't think they had Peanut Mamie Johnson. I, I want to say they they had one of the um, one of the three um, female Negro League baseball players serve with them as well. Um, I don't remember which which woman they had on the team, but the um, Negro Leagues had uh, three women play over the course of uh, Negro League history as well. Um, Damn it! What were their names? There was there was a Peanut Johnson, um, fucking God damn it! I'm gonna look it up. Sorry, help you? Sorry, yeah, Peanut Mamie Johnson, um, Tony Stone, and Connie Morgan. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, Mamie. Mamie. I got the name mixed up. Mamie Peanut Johnson. There we go. Um. And yeah, and uh, Mamie Johnson played for the Indianapolis Clowns. She was a pitcher. Her career win loss record was thirty three and eight. Actually, that's gonna make it an interesting point now. Is, is 
Well, we have already had if if, if you know MLB is, is is counting Negro League um, play as official Major League Baseball play. Does that mean we've already had our first female major leaguers? And again, in, in reference to Major League Baseball, not to discount the Major League uh, that that is the Negro Leagues. No, because they're just they're just making it you know more equal for blacks. They're not ready to do that for women yet. They're not that progressive. <laughs> it sounds. <sighs> Awful. <laughs> yeah, it sounds awful, but at the same time, Corbin's probably right. Uh, I know, and it's not like I don't know. It, let's you know, let's take it another step further. Is there a professional softball league in the United States? Like, mean, think about basketball. Is basketball really the only sport that has the women's equivalent? I mean, Josh, we've been to, and Corin was Corin was not there. Right? Josh, we've been to a national women's hockey league game. We have, and there's also, um, you know, women's soccer. There is women's soccer. There is women's soccer. You're right about that. Yeah, we're pretty good at that, so we care about those kind of women in this country. Can I bring up this ball? No. One, one thing. <sighs> All right. They announced today that at, the, at every stop on the professional disc golf tour, 2021 the payout structure for the for the victors or for the winners of each of the events is going to be an equal payout for both the men and the women divisions right on right like that's pretty fucking cool like you don't hear i mean i tell me if i'm wrong i haven't heard of anything that equivalent unless like professional women's golf pays out but i can't imagine Oh, I yeah, you you have very quickly left my realm of knowledge. Yes, sorry, but nah, I was give you. But back to the moral of the point: go women, go women, man. Two go women. two two weeks out of two weeks, we we are two episodes of the last two episodes. Go women, go women. Corwin, hey. do you have any questions for me? Uh, what's your favorite color? I've always been a blue guy. Hmm. A blue okay. guy and a tall guy guy. I respect that. Okay. Thanks, tall guy. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to jump off and let you guys talk about uh, Hall of Fame stuff. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> thanks, for, right. uh, thanks for joining in, buddy. Yeah, it was I, nice I, having I, you. <clears throat> Josh, I, I still need to talk to you. This is giving me an idea for my podcast. All right, man. I can't wait to hear it. All right. I'll talk to you. Let me know when you're done. I'll talk to you later. All right. Later, you got Bye. Right. Good night, guys. Bye. Oh, love that, man. <laughs> oh, he's such a goofball. Uh, uh, all right. So we've gotten lots of Greg on the show for the past couple of days. But, um, nice. Love yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about Mark Beerley. Um, I Good. know Mark Beerley. He was the... Uh, he was a pitcher for the Chicago White Sox, um, as well as a single season with the Miami Marlins and uh, finishing out his final three years of major league service time with the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, and he is seeing his first season on the ballot, first year on the ballot for the Hall of Fame. And he has a very interesting case. So I want to talk about it. Um, what is your impression? Do you have any recollection of Mark Pierce? the baseball pitcher absolutely like one one percent recollection i know the name and that's really all all right well let's let's talk about his uh his stats first and we'll we'll, we'll start with that so career he has 214 wins 160 losses a lifetime 3.81 era he's pitched in uh 518 games with 493 of them starts no saves uh, he has pitched a total of 3,283.1 um, innings. He has amassed 1,870 strikeouts and a career whip of 1,281 on a career with a career FIP of uh, 411. Um, over the course of his career, he led all of baseball in game start once, led the American League in game started twice. Um, in his final season in the MLB, he pitched a league 
Oh, sorry. Uh, baseball leading complete games with four. He had 33 complete games over his lifetime, uh, including 10 shutouts. Um, he led the league in innings pitched twice, led the league in hits allowed four times, led the league in batters faced twice, and led the league in whip once. He made uh, four All-Star games. He won five, sorry, five All-Star games. He won four gold gloves. He finished top five in Cy Young voting once, and he won one World Series title. Uh, so Corbin, that Oh, and to go along with that, a career lifetime, 59.1 wins above replacement. So, Corwin, on, on the numbers, how are you feeling about Mark Burley's case? You know, it's, it's kind of tough because he wasn't an overpowering pitcher. Like, none of these numbers really scream, you know, top of the order, ace in the mold of, you know, a Max Scherzer, Jacob deGrom, Clayton Kershaw, guys that'll get you strikeouts, guys that'll, you know, keep guys off the base, keep out runs. Like, he just seems like an iron horse type pitcher who, you know, he was good to get you 30 starts in a season. He was good to get you X amount of innings every time he'd go out and play. And that's where his value was brought to the table. Not necessarily the stuff or, you know, the repertoire that he carried with him. And on that note, it does make it hard for me to say, oh, yeah, absolutely a Hall of Famer. Because I I don't know him as a pitcher. I never watched him pitch. I, I can't really base anything about him, excuse me, other than the stats we have on the page. And that's where I'm struggling because I, I don't want to say, oh, no, this guy is definitely not a Hall of Famer. He doesn't deserve it because I don't know. But at the same time, what I do have is making it a hard decision. And I completely agree with you on, on, the, um, on, on the numbers end of it. I would say Mark Gurley is, um, I don't want to say compiler. Because I don't think that has like a negative connotation to it, and I, I'm not sure it's true, per se. Um, but there's there's no stretch here where you would go, oh yeah, that stretch is crazy. You know, he he's like he's like diet Andy Pettit, but somehow has a very similar war to Andy Pettit. Um, because Andy Pettit was you know number two guy forever. He was never really number one. Um, and he always pitched well, but he was never like amazing, you know? Um, yeah, I'm, like, I'm, looking, I'm actually looking at Andy Pettit's stats right now, and there's way more um, over four ERAs than I remember. And honestly, though, that makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously, Andy Pettit has like the postseason stuff, which, you know, we'll get Andy Pettit during Andy Pettit time um, when we hit the part of the bout later on. But like that—that's kind of how I picture Mark Burley. He was never like the A guy, um, but he pitched very effectively for a very significant amount of time. Sixteen seasons is, is a long time for MLB service, especially for a pitcher. Um, and he never had a negative WAR. Uh, his lowest WAR season hmm. in a complete season that he pitched was his final year with uh, one point two wins above replacement, and even then, that season he. Pitched 32 games, 198 innings, four complete games, and one complete game shutout. Like, that's a really good fucking year, you right, know? Yeah. Um, and there's two things. There's two things uh, I, I think that make him a more interesting case than is what's on the stats sheet. And uh, this, again, brings up a conversation we, we'd had just the other day about Omar Vizcal, which now looks crazy given the light that he's now under um, investigation for domestic violence, which came out what? like... Yeah, dude, like that came out yesterday, today, like right after we fucking recorded, basically, which makes that whole conversation look wild um, because now there's a good chance he doesn't get in for a completely different, very legitimate reason. Um, 
but he, yeah, like, goddamn. <laughs> wow. Right? I, um, I don't know what to say. I don't know if there is anything to say. But holy fucking shit. Uh, I know, I know. Um, anyway, um, we had kind of talked a bit about the idea of things around being a good baseball player that add to your case for getting into the Hall of Fame. And one of them, I'll start with the smaller one, is the fact that Mark Burley won a World Series with the Chicago White Sox. And that's honestly really impressive. Right? That was my first reaction was, wow, the White Sox. Hmm. That's tough. That yeah. makes it very intriguing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this is an organization that has made very few postseasons in their fucking um, existence. I, I, I forget. I know we've talked about it before on the show. Actually, let me see if I can pull up the White Sox's, like, um, baseball reference page to see how many postseasons they've gone to. Because I think in their, like, 120-year history, they've gone to, like, like 10 postseasons. Like, some crazy low. That's, that's a disgusting number. Yeah, I, I think it's, like, really, like, upsettingly low. Um, franchise page, maybe? Will it tell me? Yeah, wow. Yeah, they have been to 10 playoffs. They have been an active oh. franchise from 1901 to 19 to 2020, um, and they have been to the playoffs 10 times in 120 seasons. Holy fuck. They have won six pennants and won the World Series three times, most recently in 2005 with Mark Burley on the team, helping them get that win. Jesus Lord. Oh, my yes. God. Yeah. The last time they made the World Series before that was when they lost in 1959. Um, before that, they lost the World Series in 1919. And then their only other two World Series appearances, their two wins, came in 1917 and 1906. And if you're thinking 1917, that sounds familiar. And it's not the, the movies podcast Corwin and Josh do. That's because that is the Chicago Black Sox, Black, Black Sox scandals season, where that um, World Series had a big old asterisk on it because of uh, throwing specific games. That's a weird juxtaposition, thinking about those two. Yeah, right? I mean... I'll get over it, but at the same time, it's like, ah. Uh, oh, sorry. Actually, that was the 1919 World Series. My mistake. Oh, you fucking idiot. I am. I am. That was a little hot for me. I'm sorry. I got, I got, got it. Josh, I got, I got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept it. So, yeah, that World Series that they lost 5-3. to three. Uh, I don't even want to look at it. Um, <laughs> how, how do you... five? Why did they play the fifth? That doesn't matter. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, so they they won three worlds. So they won their World Series is um, seventy eight years apart between the second and the third World Series win. And I, this might seem like such a dumb and minor point, but I do think that being part and being a pretty big part of the streak breaking um, season matters. Yeah. I mean, granted. I don't know how much weight it will carry. For me, it's more of a, an anecdote that would be maybe a, a minuscule tiebreaker. I, I just, I couldn't have it be like, well, yeah, he won a World Series. That's fantastic. But it was also a very special World Series. Like, for Chris Bryant or, you know, the rest of the, the Cubs on that team, I don't think their Hall of Fame acceptance should come down to the fact that, oh, they played for the Cubs when they broke, you know, that record because, or broke that streak because, yes, that's wildly historic, incredible for the franchise, incredible for the players that were part of it, but 
I don't know how much it should carry into. See, the more I talk about it, the more I have to think about it, the more torn I am about it. Right. And I think that's fair because I'm not saying this is like the reason he should go. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm not saying it has to be weighted heavily, but I think there is weight there. I think that being a part, because again, and this goes back to the, the question I, I asked of Corwin um, last time, last episode, what does the Hall of Fame mean to you? And if any part of that for you is answering, well, preserving um, and recognizing co- big contributions to the game of baseball, well, where does that lead you? Does that is that going to include um, w- breaking a very large and and uh, large looming streak with a very historic franchise in pretty spectacular fashion? I mean, those two thousand five White Sox were nothing to fuck with. Like that was that postseason run. I think is still the the most postseason or sorry the fewest postseason losses in in a World Series winning season of all time. Like it, it was a ridiculous postseason. Two thousand five so, White Sox ain't nothing to fuck with. Goddamn right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Doesn't uh, doesn't quite roll off the tongue the same way. But it means just as much. Mm, it does. Uh, so again, I'm not saying that that's what I'm going to hang my hat on as a defense of of, of Mark Gurley. But I I I think I I think it means something. How much it means. I don't know, but I think it means something. The other thing that I, I think means a lot more, I, I think we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about, is Mark Beerley has a perfect game. Yeah, he's, he's one of only 23 people to have that. That's a big deal. Yeah. Um, and while a perfect game on its own wouldn't put you in the Hall of Fame, I mean, I'm I'm looking up other guys that are that have thrown perfect games. Len Barker threw a perfect game in uh, in in uh, 1981, and Len Barker has a career 12.6 WAR. He is not going to the Hall of Fame. Um, at the same that time, eh, fair enough. At the same time, Jim Bunning, which is a which is a, a very fun old fashioned white guy name. Jim Bunning threw a perfect game in 1964. Jim Bunning is in the Hall of Fame with 59.9 war, uh, basically the same war as um, uh, fucking Mark Burley. Granted, Jim Bunning has a thousand more strikeouts, literally, um, than than Mark Burley. Uh, Mark Burley sitting at, what did I say, 1800 just about? Yeah, 1870, Jim Bunning sitting at 2855. But there's a righty lefty discrepancy there, but it's still not going to cover a thousand strikeouts. Never mind. Um, you know, if we're looking at production by the error and using WAR as that baseline adjustment, does that mean anything? I don't know how how much how much does the does the perfect game mean to you? I think a perfect game means way more than a World Series title. Means way more than. Um, you know, being on that 2005 White Sox team, I think it means more than a fair amount of accolades. It's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, there's a whole lot of luck involved, and and you know, you can't talk about throwing a perfect game and not mention how lucky it is to, you know, be in that situation and 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 have that game developed the way it does because you know there's no looking at it without luck it's just man it's tough it's so tough i i know because i i think as fans we attach a lot of mythos to the perfect game and i would say rightfully so because perfect games are super cool and super rare um, again, there has been 23 of them. <sighs> this would be a much different conversation if David Cohn was in the Hall of Fame. Hmm. Which I think he 
absolutely deserves to be. And I think it is genuinely a crime that he has that he's not. Um because David because the MLB Hall of Fame Association or voting body, whatever it is, has done a v- weirdly austere job of separating the um, the the perfect game from the man of recent seasons. Some of the more recent perfect games for Hall of Fame eligible people uh, include, um, well, Mark Burley, who's who's on the ballot right now. Uh, Dallas Braden. Are you eligible, Dallas Braden? Mm, he should be. How many years is it since you retire? I think it's 10 years from retirement. Uh, it's close. I mean, Dallas Braden's not getting in, but it's close. Oh, no. Oh, hold on a second. I'm just trying to find. There we go. Uh, Yeah, five war. Jesus, I forgot he... Wow. Yeah, he only pitched for five years. I totally forgot it was that short. Um... Yeah, this motherfucker ain't going to the goddamn Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, that's, that really shows the randomness of it. But anyway, um, you know, Randy Johnson's in, but Randy Johnson's got over 100 more. That's a fucking no-brainer. Uh, David Cohn's not in. David Wells is not in. Um, Kenny Rogers is not in. How many words does David Cohn have? 62.3. He also yeah. has five World Series titles, five All Star uh, game appearances, and the Cy Young Award. Is he an asshole? No, he's a genuine fucking sweetheart. I think David Cohn got fucked on some of the traditional stats because he only has 194 wins and didn't even cross the 200 win threshold, which, as you and I have discussed before, it's just it's stupid to have to consider that because it's not something anybody gives a shit about today. But the people who vote in the hall for the Hall of Fame are not the same people who look at stats today for today and wins still matter for some reason. And he didn't cross 200 wins, let alone 300. And he didn't cross 3000 strikeouts. He has 2668. Which is a great number, but it's not three thousand. So which is insanity. I know. I know. But he's got over sixty war, a silent award, five rings, five all star games, and a perfect game. I think he should be in. I don't think Mark Burley should be, but I think David Cohn should. So I I was gonna ask, so so would you cast your ballot? For Mark Burley. I would not. I, if if I had nine votes cast and I was weighing what to do with the 10th, I would cast mine for Mark Burley just to keep him on the ballot to decide for next year. But not, like, my, 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 my ballot would be to be like, let's punt this decision for next year, it wouldn't necessarily be like, he deserves to be in today. You know what I mean? Sure. Because that is a viable... You you, you used to get this all the time back in the, like, 50s and 60s. Or 40s and 50s mostly. And then 60s and 70s a little bit less so. When the MLB Hall of Fame first became a thing, and you get people who would, like, lead guys like Babe Ruth and Todd Cobb and and um, uh, uh, fucking Ted um, Williams. Thank you. God damn it. Ted Williams off the ballot because they knew they were going to be on so many other ballots that they could add another guy um, or they would see a guy that they wanted to try to keep on so they would you know, give a, a vote to a lesser known dude in hopes that he crosses the 5% threshold required to stay on the ballot. You don't see it as much anymore today um, but I still think it would be neat. Um, Anyway, uh, I know MLB does its own thing to commemorate uh, perfect games specifically, but it is still it's it's tough because Mark Burley's like kind of right there, war wise. Like if he had ten less war, was sitting at fifty, 
I, I don't think it'd be enough. But usually that Hall of Fame threshold's like sixty, and he's like right there. Mm-hmm. But it's like not, and he's got that cool World Series win, and he's got that really cool per game. But that's kind of it, right? And it's that's what I'm saying. It's it's a weird case, you know. It's a weird case because I I I think I'm a big Hall guy. Um. I'm not bought on Mark Burley being in, but if you're a guy that values non stat sheet things, I think he's a really interesting dude for that reason. I don't know. I get, believe me, I get it. It's tough, you know, but. I just don't think he did quite enough with his his stuff to be Hall of Very Good, undoubtedly. I just don't know if it's Hall of Fame worthy. worthy. That's fair. Let's look at um. Let's look at Roy Holiday real quick. Cause he just got in. Um, another recent perfect gamer. Uh, Roy Holiday. He had Cy Youngs, right? He had yeah, he had two Cy Youngs and eight All Star games and five more WAR, twenty more wins and three hundred more strikeouts, in the same number of seasons. Oh yeah, and, and Roy Halladay has way more black ink than Mark Burley does. He he led he led in things that mattered like, um, com- Jesus, he led the league in complete games, uh, one two three four five six seven times, shutouts four times. Innings pitched four times, hits twice, but it's because of all the innings pitched. Um, home runs per nine, he led in once. Whip, he led in once. Um, walks per nine, he led three consecutive seasons. Strikeout to walk ratio, he led in five seasons. Jesus, yeah, it's not even. Uh, yeah, it's not even close. That's that's what's so weird. That's only five more better the than that. Definitely stuck with the boot. <laughs> True. Um, like, there's no way they left him. They would leave him off the ballot after that kind of incident. You know, like, yeah. As much as he absolutely deserved getting into the Hall of Fame, and especially on like the first ballot. You knew. I truly don't get that. Because Mark Gurley was still diminished. Really- just saying it because I just it's a ridiculous age. Yeah, no, I totally get it. You know him far better than I would. Yeah, just you know the way it is. That's the way the news goes. Yeah, because I I don't That's think the way and. I don't think anybody else coming up that threw a perfect game is really going to be a conversation for Hall of Fame. Like, Dallas Braden's not. Uh, Philip, Philip Humber, who was uh, one of the trio of pitchers to throw a perfect game in 2012, um, he has a career war of 0.9. So he's not he in has, the conversation. He, he has a lower war for his career than he probably had for that one game. <laughs> wow, you know what? Yeah, you're probably... So he threw it in 2012 with the White Sox. Look at that. Um, and that season... Oh my... my God, that season he had a negative one, one war. Oh my God. Do you think what fucking the f- drunk alcoholic put down like 30 bucks on him to throw a perfect game on that one crazy ass game, just, just absolutely to the wind, and then it just ha- 
happened to hit. It was just like, oh, I don't know what those odds would have been. Astrophonomical? Oh my god. I mean, oh, wow. Like, how? Oh man, that was in the first half of the season, too. Imagine how hype everyone was in. No, never mind. And because in the first half of the season, with a perfect game included, still had um, an ERA of 6.01 and a whip of 1485. Oh my god. Yeah, he threw it in May. 14? Yeah. Holy so, shit. so he threw that. He threw that complete that that perfect game in May, and, and in May he had an OPS allowed of seven seventy five, uh, which is a one hundred thirteen OPS plus. That's including the perfect game. That's disgusting. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Wow. That's just next level. I think we should go back and like watch the broadcast just so we could hear the announcers just being like, what the fuck are we watching? Yeah, we, we might have to talk about that. Cause that is that is ridiculous. Hey, speaking um, of announcers, it's Don Rosillo's birthday today. So, happy birthday, Don. Happy birthday, Don. Um, just to wrap it up real quick, Matt Cain um, threw also the who threw a perfect game in 2012, 29 war. Um, he's not going to the Hall of Fame. And uh, Felix Hernandez, the final one, I I think I is is uh, actually Felix Hernandez is going to be an interesting case when we get to him. He has too. to be, man. Like, how do you not put Felix in the Hall? He has 50 war. But it's Felix Hernandez. I like, know. I get- I get the career has been pretty awful, but you, the peak that he had is just on par with any of you know peak in baseball. Like, and that's what I would argue as well. It's the, it's the Sandy Koufax argument. the The peak was ridiculously high, um, and I, I guess that's one of the other things that makes it tough tougher to look at Mark Burley because if his stats were like spread out differently where he had bad seasons when he was young and bad seasons when he was old and had a Felix Hernandez style insane peak I would maybe think more favorably of his Hall of Fame case with the perfect game being able to push him over and be saying definitely yes but without it because it's weird again looking at the numbers on the page in terms of overall career production and looking at Felix Hernandez and saying, yes, with his 50 war, he is almost a surefire Hall of Famer. Whereas Mark Burley, with his nine additional war in in the same amount of seasons, basically, is not. Um, and that's what's weird about deciding these things, is that it's not just so strictly what's on the page and what's not. Um, it's about how it's spread out, how it's presented, what that looked like when it was happening. Yeah, you know, it, it's that's what makes the Hall of Fame discussion so fucking odd. Oh man, I I wish I had a deciding vote. I wish I was able to cast a ballot, but at the same time. I feel like I'd let the pr- well. On one hand, I, I I do not know enough of these players to ever be qualified to do so, but I feel like the pressure would get to me, man. Oh my god! I don't I don't need the uh, the Twitter critics. Like the feeling uh, I forget the ump's name, but of essentially calling. Um, now what was the perfect game that got fucked up because. Um, oh, um, um, safe, even though it was clear he was out. Galarraga? Yeah, um, Galarraga with the Tigers. Yeah. Um, wasn't that also in like 2012 or around then? I'm looking it up. I want to say it was around then, yeah. Uh, 2010. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Armando Galarraga. Of like being an ump in that situation, I feel like, oh man, that must be soul crushing, which uh, I'm almost certain it was. I mean, it's been very well documented how crushed that 
Ump was, again, forgetting his name, but deciding whether or not someone goes into the hall, who, you know, it's not like deciding whether Clayton Kershaw goes in or Randy Johnson or, like, one of these guys that's... It's very clear that they are deserving of that, but guys who are really good, really great guys to begin with, and then just like, hey, you either are or are not good enough, and I have to figure it out. That's a lot of pressure. I don't want that. It's a crazy amount of pressure. Uh, real quick for anyone wondering, uh, here are the Cy Young wi- or not Cy Young, um, the perfect game holders, and whether or not they are in the Hall of Fame, Cy Young. Yep. Uh, 163 war is certainly enough to do it. <laughs> um, Addy Joss, yes, is in the Hall of Fame. 45 war, but is in. Um, under 1,000 strikeouts. That's hilarious. Charlie Robertson, not in the Hall of Fame for one of our, our older dudes. It's kind of, that's almost weird to see. He threw it in 1922, but he also only played for eight seasons with an amassed 6.4 war in that time. A career ERA of 4.44. So good job on the old guys. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, Don Larson, our boy, uh, who threw his in the World Series against the Brooklyn Dodgers, but he's also not in the Hall of Fame. Um, Also deservedly so. Uh, He played 14 seasons, but only amassed 18.4 career war in that time. Uh, Jim Bunning, whom we discussed, is in the Hall of Fame. Sandy Koufax, whom we mentioned, with his 48.9 war, is in the Hall of Fame. Um, Catfish Hunter, with his 40.9 war, is also in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Len Barker, with 12.6 war, as we mentioned, not in the Hall of Fame. Mike Witt, 21.6 war, not in the Hall of Fame. Tim Browning, 19.8 war, not in the Hall of Fame. Dennis Martinez, uh, 48.7 war, not in the Hall of Fame. Kenny Rogers, 50.5 war, not in the Hall of Fame. David Wells, 53.5 war, not in the Hall of Fame. David Cohn, 62.3 war, not in the Hall of Fame. Randy Johnson, 101.1 war, in the Hall of Fame. And then we mentioned the rest. Um, Philip Humber, not in the Hall of Fame. Um, uh, Mark Burley not in the Hall of Fame, and we, we Dallas Braden not in the Hall of Fame. We mentioned the rest, so uh, we're how they in, yada yada yada. So that's that full list. Yada yada yada. I mentioned the bisque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, real, real, real quick. I want to go through uh, the other guys who are uh, first year on the ballot to get your impression of um, whether or not you would vote for them. This will be our vote to see if we discuss them and their cases going forward. Uh, Tim Hudson, first year on the ballot. I don't know well enough. 57.9 war um, career. Uh, he, he, was a, um, he was a pitcher for the, uh, for the Braves for a long time. Um, I don't think there's anything really here. I don't, I don't think he'll go. Um, I don't think it's going to be close. Uh, Mark Burley, we just talked about Tory Hunter. Hmm. Maybe. I think he's one of those Hall of Very Good guys. I don't know if he's Hall of Fame. I think he's probably Hall of Fame. Again, I, I never really watched. I only know the reputation. Yeah, I mean, great outfielder, great center fielder, but uh, 50.7 war, and he, he, not enough blocking. He's probably just not going to go. Uh, Dan Heron. Yes, absolutely, for Twitter game alone. You know what? Fair enough. Uh, Barry Zito? Probably not. No. Aramis Ramirez? Do not know him. Yeah, that's not... Yeah, fair. Um, Shane Victorino? Um, I don't think so, but again, that might just be reputation. No, he's got tw- uh, 31 career war, so I highly doubt it. Uh, AJ Burnett? Uh, that'd be nice, but I doubt it. Yeah. Sorry, Pirates. Nick Swisher. 100%. <laughs> yeah, just for all the bros. Um, Latroy Hawkins. 
Again, don't know. And Michael Cudier. Definitely don't know. Yeah, it's not a very strong ballot for the um, first year guys. The only guy I would say maybe to is Mark Burley for reasons we discussed, and I would I wouldn't give a yes to literally anybody else. Um, which I think stands to reason why you might end up seeing an increase for Clemens and Bonds because there's no first year guys who are gonna really suck any votes away from anybody. Um, but I I guess we'll see. I fucking hope so, man. I, I like, Clemens, sure, whatever. I really hope Bond gets in. I mean, Clemens I deserves it, too. Else. 140 wars is, is a lot. Wait, Clemens has 140 war? Yeah. What? Did you not know this? No. Yeah, Roger Clemens has, like, seven Cy Young awards. Okay, all right. Seven Cy Youngs, an MVP, two Triple Crowns, 11 All-Stars, two World Series, seven-time ERA title, Major League Player of the Year, and an All-Star MVP vote. Um, he led baseball in wins four times. Not the league, all of baseball in wins four times. Win percent three times. Led the league or baseball in ERA. Oh, uh, let's see. One, four, six, five, seven times. Had led the led all of baseball in complete games once, and it all of and led the league in complete games twice. Led the league in shutouts five times, six times. Um, oh, sorry, actually, he led. He had complete game. He led in complete games three times. My mistake. Led the league. Led all of baseball in innings pitched twice. Led the league in strikeouts five times and hit by pitches once. That's funny. Um. Uh, Batters oh. faced. He led all baseball in once. He had the highest ERA plus in all of baseball. Another nine times. Um, had the lowest FIP in baseball. Fucking twelve times. Lowest WHIP in baseball three times. Uh, lowest home hits per nine four times. Home runs per nine twice. Highest strikeouts per nine three times. Highest strikeout to walk ratio uh, four times. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous. It's a stupid career. What the fuck? I had no idea. Like, I knew he was good, and I knew Roger Clemens was one of the all-time greats, or was considered that at the very least. Wasn't quite fully aware of the accolades and prestige. My God. Oh, dude, yeah, it's a ridiculously stupid career. I mean, my goodness. Uh, yeah. Roids? I mean, I know Roids, but, like, did he actually do Roids? Was it the accusation? It, I th I think this is the same thing as Bonds, where it's like there might have been a positive test, but, again, at that point in time before there was any rules against it. So it's like, how how do you hold this against a guy? And are the – and how is the test done? And, and you know – was, was was there a test or was there a rumor of a test? I, I think it's literally the Bond story. Bond's being a little more obvious because he got gigantic, um, and Clemens didn't. But um, still, yeah, fucking crazy. Yeah, so there there is literally between those two dudes three hundred wars sitting on the ballot that are on their ninth year. Yeah. Yep. Lovely. I'm glad baseball voters are, you know, progressive and, and open minded to the times. It's it's just buying into what um Bud Seelig and Rob Manfred told you. That's all it is. Is it's hey, we didn't feel like punishing them, but now we do, so you should vote for them. And every all the voters is going like, Oh, okay. They cheated. Even though what they did wasn't against the rules at the time, they cheated. And to some extent, I can I can get behind that. If okay, there's no rule against I don't know, eating children before games because it makes you stronger. But you still do it. Yeah, okay, that's kind of fucked up. Don't do that. It's against the rules. But when it's the entirety of the league doing it together. 
I don't know. It's it's definitely not as bad as eating babies. We all know that. Some sacrifices to Jobu are worse than others, but I think it's something we need to just kind of accept as like, hey, like this was done by a large majority of the league. We kind of need to accept that and understand that's the way things are. Yeah, and 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 again, it's not like it's not. This is not the conversation you and I are going to have when Robinson Cano comes on the ballot in I don't know six or seven years. It's actually five years after retirement. By the way, I was wrong. Um, I think I said ten. Um, so anyway, it's 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 not going to be the because Robinson Cano tested positive for for uh, performance enhancing um, whatever, um, like twice. And 10, 20 years after the whole steroid scandal went down, back there are now established rules about what you can and can't do in regards to performance-enhancing substances. And Cano knows that. Again, it was not against the rules at the time. And while you might want to high horse, a high, high pedestal, um, you know, high morality look down upon all this shit and say, I would never do this. I know that taking drugs is wrong. You weren't fucking there, man. And it wasn't against the goddamn rules. Yeah. And they were good drugs, so I wanted to take them. God. Like, you know, some 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 teachers don't let you have open book during tests, and some teachers let you have open book during tests. Does that mean that if you are allowed to have an open book during a test, you shouldn't do it because it was against the rules somewhere else, or someone else might think something about it? Shouldn't you know all the answers anyway? See how stupid that fucking sounds? Uh, Everyone else brought a book, I've, and it's gonna fuck up the curve. You better bring your fucking book. I don't know if I agree with that one, just because I, I failed open book tests, and you don't need that kind of pressure. Steroids are a little different, but I get the idea. I get the idea. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sure Clemens let up a home run while he was on board, so. All right, touche. You're right back <laughs> in it. <laughs> we all have our moments. <laughs> Um, any, anything else to, to say before we go? Um, no, I guess not. Do you want to talk about the Steelers loss? No. Fair enough. Um, if the Steelers keep losing and keep imploding, okay, we can definitely have that conversation. Um, but I mean, they lost to a, a team that's hot right now. With a great defensive line, and they lost to the Bills, which are a very good team to begin with. I don't think it's panic time yet. Do you want to talk about the Browns' loss? Uh, to what extent? It was fun. It was fun. I will tell you that. But at the same time, again, like it, it wasn't a bad loss. Like it. I'm not going to look at that and say, ooh, shit, I don't know, man. That's that's tough to say. Like, ah, uh, the Browns, like, it's time to panic, maybe? Like, no, like, they're they're fine. For for the team, it's not a bad loss. For for a fan, that's a gut-wrenching loss. Ooh, yeah. 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 If you, if you are in the Browns locker room, like, that really sucks. But, like, you know your team is really good. You just, you know, got marginally... As literally just so marginally outplayed, um, three points with a handful of seconds left. Um, but if you're a fan, oh my god, that fucked up your entire existence for at least seventy two hours. Oof, undoubtedly. Yeah. All right. Well then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Then we'll uh, we'll get out of here. Uh, if you uh, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Juicing Pod. If you want to hit us up via email, you can do so at Juicing the Numbers at Gmail Hire us, pay us, give us money, give us ideas. We're here for anything. We are down to clown. Um, and uh, yeah, if <laughs> sorry, I'm that's saying, all I really have to say. I am not down to clown. Corwin oh is down. God. He's got the wig. He's got the makeup. He's got the shoes. Um, oh, I have. Get, yeah, he's got the shoes. And uh, I guess that. I guess that's kind of it. So uh, until uh, until Monday, y'all have a good one. Bye.